finds the lecture, oh, okay. Who thinks that I speak too fast and then the lectures are too fast? Of course, that may be a different question. Do I speak too fast? Okay. Are the lectures too slow? Okay. Are the lectures too fast? Okay, too slow, good. <laughs> okay, no, ja oh, are the lecture right? <laughs> No, you see, it doesn't match. <laughs> there are too many undecided people. <laughs> this, is not, this is not correct. OK, so um, I think I'm going to start. So today, I think it's a key lecture, because I think we are, I really want to connect this rotation and Gauss map. And it's going uh, to be our first example of renormalization. And it's really the basic idea of renormalization. But I think uh, even though. Uh, Someone thinks it's too slow, and almost all of you know continuous fractions. I decided that I made a mistake in skipping. I want to have on the board a, a couple of the properties that you almost all already know about continuous fractions, because I'm going to need them today. So let me first start with uh, this quick uh, uh, recall. So recall for almost all of you. Recalled from continued fractions. So I also need, I need the same notation. So we have alpha irrational, and we have, uh, hence alpha has a unique infinite continued fraction expansion, where these entries are positive integers. And uh, I want to, probably if you've already seen, uh, I can define truncation. So I want to call Pn over Qn finite continued fractions obtained by terminating the fraction at an. So this is infinite, but I stop it at a finite level, and then I can clear out the nominators and I get a rational. So these are called convergent of alpha. And we are going to use them today. Actually, the denominators we are going to use. And uh, let me recall you some, some facts about this convergence. So, so just three facts. So first of all, this convergence, you may well believe, will converge to uh, alpha. So as uh, n grows, you will tend to the infinite continued fraction. And actually, uh, this convergence is exponentially fast. This I don't need, but it's just for your. They converge exponentially fast, in the sense that you can bound the difference between alpha and the n truncation. And this is less than some constant over something like square root of 2 to the n. Exponentially small. <coughs> uh, maybe we'll go here. And then the key thing that you probably have seen, because it's one of the things you do in continuous fraction, there are recursive formulas. So especially uh, the QN and the PN, the nominators and numerators, both satisfy uh, this set of recursive equations. So qn plus 1 is an plus 1 qn plus qn plus qn minus 1. Uh, this is a recursive relation involving the denominators and the entries. And also you have initial condition. So q0 is actually, you set it 1, and q1 is a0. And the Pn satisfy actually the same recursive formula. So Pn plus 1 is also equal to An plus 1 Pn plus Pn minus 1. And the same formula, but different initial conditions. So you want to take P0 to be A0 and P1 to be uh, A0 Q1 plus 1. Doesn't matter so much, just a recursive formula. Uh, for Actually, I don't need the p's, I will just need the q's. Have you seen this when you did continued fractions? Okay, great. So uh, if you want, in principle, you could try to prove them. So it's just a manipulation of continued fractions. So if you haven't seen them, you may want to play with them. But I want today we will see a dynamical interpretation. So with this formula will be, have a dynamical meaning. So. I don't care about manipulating continuous fraction. I care about giving it a dynamical meaning. And similarly, let me tell you the third property that you also know, probably, that uh, uh, these are best approximations. So 
So there are something called best approximation of the first type or the second type, I don't, kind, I don't ever remember which one, but I say I want this one. So if I look at this uh, distance, this is actually less, uh, it's the best possible. So this is the best approximation among all rationals with denominator bounded by QN. So this distance is less than, um, let's say, put less or equal to, have to be safe, but I think less is correct, Q alpha minus P for every p integer and for every uh, q1, one. one less than q, less than q1. Yeah, I say, I say I put less or equal, I guess I want to put, well, let's put less or equal, that's fine. So in any case, they minimize uh, the distance from, uh, from integers. So maybe you can also, you can use this notation, you can write uh, uh, norm of x, uh, z to be the um, minimum of x plus n as n is an integer. So, and then you can kind of read this as uh, saying q n alpha less than uh, q alpha for q less or equal than q n. Okay? So, this is like distance from integers. So this is all I wanted to remind you. And first thing I want to remind, uh, I want to give a dynamical more than geometric. What does this tree mean? Dynamical interpretation of property tree. Of tree. So what does this tree say about the orbit of the rotation? How do I uh, find QN if I look at an orbit of the rotation in space? They are best approximation, but dynamically, so I, I'm going to draw a plot, a large circle. I have to do many pictures today. So I'm, I'm going to put a zero on top of my circle, just because I like zero on top. But so if I look at the orbit of zero, so if I look at the orbit uh, under the rotation by alpha of zero, so this is just uh, basically a fractional part of uh, uh, n alpha. Uh, well, you know, on the circle is whatever, in, in, on, the, in, on the zero one is fractional part of n alpha. But um, say that I plot my, What, what, are, what, are, uh, what is special about the QN? If I look at the QN iterate of the orbit of zero, how will I recognize that I'm special? Uh, you're just shy or? So maybe my question is clearly unformulated. Okay, maybe. So this property tells me that when I have at the QN, the distance from uh, zero, uh, on the circle is less than all the previous iterates, okay? So uh, I want to say if I look at the distance between r alpha q of zero and zero, this is nothing else than uh, the q alpha, this uh, integer norm, it's the distance from integers. And uh, uh, qn are successive closest returns. And by this I mean, so if I keep iterating my rotation, at some point, well, I start from zero, I go far from zero, at some point I get back close to zero. And this is actually going to be the first, uh, the orbit at Q1. At Q1, I'm very close to zero. Then if I keep moving, well, I will again go farther from zero. And maybe when I come back, I actually come back, uh, but not as close as before. So I might have to keep going, keep going. And I come back, and maybe I come back again, close, but not as close as Q1. So if I wait until uh, Q2, I will actually be, uh, actually I will be on the other side. And I will be, uh, uh, maybe I should draw it smaller. I will be, actually Q2 is the first which is closer distance from zero is less than the distance of Q1. 
and so on. If I keep going, it will, will take me longer and longer and longer number of iterates. But at some point, I will be, uh, this will be the Q3 iterate, it will be even closer, and then so on. And actually, a fact that you can convince yourself, and it also comes from a continued fraction, is that, uh, remark is that R alpha to the QN of zero uh, alternate between left and right. So now I will get it wrong. Let's see Q1. So this is, is the left of the, uh, is left of the origin, left to, uh, to the left of zero, if N is odd, and it's to the right of zero if N is even, okay? So the closest return is once to the right and then to the left and then to the right and then to the left and they are kind of accumulate towards zero, okay? Great. Uh, now I want to mm, mm, understand, so this is the dynamical interpretation. So I want to understand uh, what happens on small scales. So in some sense I want to zoom in around neighborhoods of zero and I will use this special closest returns to pick a family of neighborhoods of zero. So, okay. okay, so let me define, let me set, let me give a notation, set uh, I n to be, uh, this will be an arc, to be an arc, but sometimes I will think of it as an interval. So we always uh, identify the circle with an interval. So arc, but I will straighten it up and think of it as an interval. But I, for now I want it on the circle because I want an arc with n points. n points are alpha to the qn of zero and are alpha to the qn minus one of zero. This morning I was trying to get my indices co consistent and let me check my, I hope one. If it's off, it can be off by one, but I think I checked it in the morning and I want it with n and n minus one to be consistent. Let's see. I lost my notes. Uh, yes. Okay, so, uh, and I, I cannot tell you which one because some ones it will be one to the right, one to the left, and the other time it will be the other way around, right? So in my picture over here, this would be, for example, between one and two. Uh, this yellow interval, ah, this yellow interval will be, ah, did I get it wrong? I, I want it to be, I two, I guess it's correct, I two. And uh, I one actually will be, uh, Q one is actually, sorry, Q zero is, uh, Q zero is one, is it right? Q0 is one, so alpha. So I have to take the point alpha. So if this is alpha, and this would be actually uh, I1. I1 has endpoints at uh, Q1 and Q0 and Q1. Q0 and Q1, yes, that's right. Sorry, did I confuse everybody already? Uh, the endpoints are n and n minus, n, Qn and Qn minus one iterates of zero. So if I want the endpoints of I1, I have to, the endpoints or I1 will be uh, Q0 and Q1. Uh, but Q0 is actually uh, one, so this is actually alpha, because the zero after one iterate maps to alpha. And this one is this point that I have over there. So this is like uh, the first interval, and the second will be smaller. And essentially what's happening is that I have an arc, which is my I1. Oh gosh, this chalk is not good. There is zero somewhere in between. And then at some point, one endpoint I keep, and uh, one endpoint I keep, and the other endpoint I shrink. So I get another interval which contains zero, but it's smaller on one side. This will be I2. And this is, then I will keep this interval and wait for the next closest return, which will happen on the left, and so on. So I'm getting a sequence n plus one contained in I n. So these are nested arcs. And each one has one endpoint in common with the previous one. Okay, by, by definition. 
And this will be the intervals on which I want to zoom. So I want to study the dynamics of the rotation on these two smaller scales. And I will define in a second inducing. But before doing that, let me make a, a convention so, and an easy remark. So by convention, I'm going to decide that I minus 1, which is not defined here, I minus 1, I'll take it to be, uh, I write it, uh, I'll take it to be basically the whole circle. Maybe let me write it like this. It's S1 cut open at alpha. So if I have my whole circle, this is 0, this is alpha. I'm going to take my pair of scissors and cut it open at alpha. So I can draw a little scissors. Okay. And so the interval looks like this. It's 0, contains 0, and uh, here it's alpha, and here it's, uh, this length is 1 minus alpha. So this point is minus 1 plus alpha. Okay. This is my starting interval. And uh, so, of course, it's just a different choice for opening up the circle. So how does the rotation look like when I cut open my circle? Well, we, we draw the graph. We said it's uh, uh, x plus alpha mod 1. In this case, it would be x plus alpha modulo this interval. So we had a plot, you remember, of the, of the graph of the rotation. But I want to think dynamically. So dynamically, how does the rotation look like? I have two intervals, one of length alpha, one of length 1 minus alpha. And I want to just say that if you cut open a rotation, it looks like a, an exchange of two intervals. So what happens when I rotate the big arc? Ah, sorry, this is length, this point is minus 1 plus alpha. This is the length. So when I add alpha, uh, this just shifts. So I'm going to draw the image by the rotation of these intervals geometrically. And this is just shifted. And it goes exactly to the end of the interval. And uh, uh, the other one is just, uh, what happens to the other one? Uh, I'm adding alpha. And then I have to take the result modulo what I have. So when I do it, it just goes back exactly to the other pit, right? So this is how a rotation looks when you cut it open. It looks, no matter where you cut it open, it will look like an exchange of two intervals. So maybe let me write this as interval exchange, interval exchange map of two intervals. So the rotation it, uh, is, is equivalent to this. In general, so if you have, uh, and this is also called 2IT, uh, interval exchange map. In general, you could have a DIT, and this would be a map where you have uh, uh, an interval, and you chop it up into D subintervals of any length you want. And then you kind of permute them. In this case, you need to specify how you want to rearrange them, but uh, you can kind of permute them so that each has the same length in the image. And they, you rearrange them so that they again form an interval of length 1. Okay? I'm telling you this because I will give you an exercise later which involves an interval change of three intervals. Okay. And actually, I can tell you what the, okay, no, no, I cannot tell you yet. Okay. <coughs> and now I just want one, another easy thing, and then we can do, uh, maybe I'm going too slow. So first I'll also, uh, no, I want to tell you what does it mean to induce. So what does it mean inducing? Inducing. So if I, if let me say in general, if I have a dynamical system from x to x, f from x to x, and I have a subset of my system, y, and assume that I know, assume that for every y in y, or maybe not for every, but for almost every, with respect to some measure, for almost every y in y, uh, 
uh, the point returns to my set. And you just did Poincaré recurrence this morning, so uh, this is not such a big assumption, you will believe. So assume that y in, for every y in y, there exists an n such that fn of y belongs to y again. So this is a return time. For example, this is true for our rotation for any interval just because orbits are dense. So if I pick any interval, points will come back infinitely often actually to them. But uh, if I point a recurrence, this would also be the case for measure preserving. Or... Okay, assume that you know this, then you can define the induced map. Then you can define, uh, I will call it Fy from y to y. This is the induced map. Sometimes you can, we can also call it first return map. Sometimes we can also call it Poincaré map. But Poincaré, maybe I like to use it for sections of flows better. I'm not sure if it's, uh, okay. But let's say it's an induced map. And what is this? This is just, uh, you wait until the point come back and define a map from y to y by setting fy of y equal to f to the r, uh, r, let's call it ry of y of y. So where, so let me explain this. So what is the ry of y? It's an integer, it's a power, so this is not a power, this is a, uh, composition. This is Ry of Y composition. It's the usual notation of F composed with F that number of time. And Ry is the first return time. So it's the minimum N greater or equal than 1 such that Fn of Y is back in Y. So this is first return time. Okay, and now I have all the statements to, to state what I want to show you and the algorithm I want to explain. Okay, we leave over there. Uh, I want the CRM somewhere that I don't erase. So, okay, maybe I'll do it here. I keep the endpoint, I keep the intervals, and what I claim is that, uh, maybe I'll take the way I wrote it. So the main proposition, so let me say uh, the induced map, map of R alpha, maybe let's give it a name. Let's call this induced map T to the N. I'm calling it T, be, uh, okay, because it's, okay. The induced map, this is the definition. The induced map T to the N, T to the N is just the name of the induced map. The induced map of the rotation on uh, these uh, intervals IN, contained in S1, is actually an exchange of two arcs, is an exchange of two arcs. And I'm going to call these arcs delta N and delta n minus 1. Again, I hope my indices are right. Um, uh, let me just check my indices. Uh, delta n and delta n plus 1, correct. And, uh, and for n greater than 1, and for grand greater than 1, I want to say, uh, so the, let me let I'll n, ln lambda n be the length. This is the length of this arc. Uh, this is the arc length. So, so we have that lambda uh, n divided by lambda n minus 1 is actually the ratio of the length of these two arcs is actually given by the nth iterate of the Gauss map. So I see the Gauss map as ratios of these induced uh, lengths. Uh, moreover, you can also say what are the return times. The first return times, uh, first return times, 
first return times are uh, respectively Qn minus 1 and Qn, respectively. So, and it's mismatched indices. So, Qn minus 1 is the return for uh, delta n, and uh, Qn would be the return for delta n minus 1. Well, uh, yeah. And this is what I want to uh, prove today and show you, but at least begin the proof. But uh, I want to first explain what this means. So, what am I saying? I have my rotation. I have this sequence of nested intervals, and I claim that if I look at this nth nested interval, the dynamic which I see as the first return map is a, a exchange of two intervals. So the dynamics of the Poincaré map or the first return map will be uh, something like this. I will have two intervals which are exchange. So when I wait for my rotation to come back to this small arc, I see two intervals which are exchanged. And the iterates that I need to do of the rotation to come back are different for the two intervals. So in one case, I have to wait for one. I will have to wait Qn iterates to come back. For the other, I have to wait Qn minus one iterates to come back. But uh, I just thought I spent some time to say at the beginning that a rotation, you can think of it as a exchange of two intervals. Because now, if you want, I can glue back, glue to circle. So if I glue to a circle this map, these two intervals, and I rescale, uh, rescale the circle to unit one. So if I rescale the circle to unit one, then this induced map rescaled is actually uh, you get a rotation by uh, Gauss to the n of alpha. So basically, this inducing is also giving me a map from rotations to rotations. And basically, th this, this, this map is renormalization. So, so this map, we'll call it R, renormalization. So renormalization, if you want, um, renormalization is R of my rotation is actually uh, obtained by uh, R induced on, R alpha induced on this interval I n, and then uh, 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 rescaled. And this is actually equal to R of Gauss to the n of alpha. So the, on the parameter space of rotations, or rotation numbers, this renormalization procedure is described by the Gauss map. OK? So just to understand my time. So I'm start, I started, and I have only 20. How much time do I have now? Uh, I, now we have to work. This is kind of all the introduction. And OK, I made also some pictures, because I, I'll try to make a picture on the board, but uh, it's not clear that it will be as nice. So maybe I, I, I keep also pictures on top. And I would, so I would put these pictures on, on the web. So I would suggest that maybe you look and don't try to write, too, because it might conf you, you can get a different picture, and then you get confused. So just look at the pictures and listen, and then, OK. OK. And also, I will post some. So I'm, I'm afraid I, fin uh, the, I posted some lecture notes in the other days we were from a course which I was teaching in the introduction to dynamical system. But this part is not written in a lecture notes form. So, but I have some handwritten notes that I think are quite nicely written. And I scan them and I'll uh, put them online. So you can find this procedure described with all details in the notes also. OK, so we consider our rotation by alpha. So this is our rotation. And the first interval I want to look at, I want to set, set uh, delta 0 to be 0 alpha. OK? Actually, all these intervals, you could make them semi-open if you want. So then you have. OK, so this is my red interval. Is it red? No, 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 no. It's the first green interval in this picture, OK? Maybe it's bigger in my picture. And maybe I'll do it green also here. So the first thing is, how many iterates uh, can I fit before overpassing 0? So how many full copies of 
Uh, so remember that uh, um, if I take A0, A0 by definition is, uh, if I divide 1 by alpha and take the integer part, this gives me A0. So A0 is actually how many times I can fit an interval of uh, size alpha in a unit circle. So uh, iterate, so I want to iterate uh, delta 0 A0 times. So this is what I did in my picture. One, two, three, four. I iterate a certain number of times. And this number of time, A0, is exactly how many times I can fit a full interval. And then what is left is going to be a reminder. Um, what, what is left is supposed to be, that's why I like a picture on the, the, What is left, this is going to be my reminder, and I'm going to call it delta 1. I need green again. So delta 0 was the original arc, and delta 1 will be my first arc. And the let delta 1 be the reminder. And notice, notice that, that alpha is r alpha to the q1 of 0, because q1 is equal to 1. So this endpoint is r alpha to the q1 of 0. And that endpoint, what is it? And the left endpoint, the left endpoint of, uh, of uh, delta 1 is r alpha to the a0 of 0. But a0, if you remember this recursive formula, a0 is q1. So this is r alpha to the q1 of 0. So the endpoints of these two intervals are exactly r alpha to the q, sorry, r alpha to the q0 and r alpha, did, did I write it right? q0, this is q, sorry, 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 sorry. This was q0. q0 is 1 and q1 is a1. So what I wanted to say that what I define to be I1 is the union of delta 0 and delta 1. Okay. And I claim that now I want to induce, so this is my first inducing interval. I'll do it yellow. The union of these two is exactly what I want to induce. And I guess I have a pointer, yes. OK, so this is where now I want to focus. It's my first induction. So what is the Poincare map, the first return map of the rotation on the yellow interval? So let's see what happens to the red interval. So 0 is mapped to alpha, because I'm rotating by alpha, right? So 0 is mapped to alpha. So the other endpoint will drag along. And the red interval will just move to the end of the yellow interval. OK? So 0 goes to alpha, and what the reminder goes, well, whatever it is. And this is already back. The red interval, in one step, is back to the yellow. So the return map just takes one iterate. So maybe I can say, uh, not if I want to write everything, because uh, um, what do I want to say? I want to say that r alpha of delta, what is it called, delta 1, is already contained in delta uh, in, in i, i1. Uh, uh, so, so the return time is 1. But notice that 1 is also q. The, the first iterates are confusing because uh, 1 is also q0. So we proved that 1 returns in q0 iterate. What about the green bit? So the green bit. Now I wish I had a, we can use think of the pointer. Does the pointer point? No. Oh, gosh. Where is the pointer? Ah, uh, here. So this green, maybe I'll move it again. So this green bar is my green arc. So I can follow it, follow it, follow it, follow it up to here. The last time it comes back, it will actually follow this bit and exactly fill the spot which I had, right? So delta 1, so what I want to say, that, sorry, delta 0 returns. In how many iterates did it return? Eh? Ah, sorry? 
And I want, uh, I said, what did you say? Who said, you said, huh? Huh? No, the, the green one, no, the green one, uh, the green one moves, rotate by alpha every time. Five in my picture, in general, uh, what is the number? So we had, it fits A0 times fully. So I, I start with one copy, I have to move to the second, to the third, to the A0 ones, and then I have to do one more iterate. So it's actually A0, because it's A0 minus one plus one. So I return in A0 iterates in A0 iterates, and A0 is Q1 by definition. So we proved the first step of our assumption. So we proved that uh, we come back in, uh, in uh, Q0, Q1 types, and then the induced map is an interval exchange of two intervals. What happens next? Ah, this is too fast. What happens next? So now I need to induce on the yellow, uh, so sorry, I need to induce on a smaller interval, which I don't know yet what it is. But first, let me remark that uh, if I look at returns, remark, if I look at returns of the rotation to this I1, Every time I return to the yellow interval, how, I can't forget what happens in between. When I return in the yellow interval, I'm actually doing one iterate of the induced map. Okay, so returns of I1 are iterates of T1. T1 is this induced map, this exchange of these two intervals. So let me just try to what, what happens of the, to understand what happens of the red interval. I'll draw it right here. What happens of my red interval when I apply my exchange of two intervals? So this is green, and my map T1 maps it here, and this is red, and my map T1 maps it there. So if I look at the red interval, the first iterate, uh, the first iterate is here. What happens then? Then I have to think of it as a part of the original interval and drag it along with the green. So you, you have to draw, plot some orbit of some interval change, especially if next week it will be good. So my map takes it here. Then if you want, think of it as part of zero one, and then you drag it along. So I want to say that this is uh, T1 of my interval delta, what was it, delta one. This is delta one. And then if you look at T2, this is actually gonna be a copy adjacent to the, to the left. Sorry, T1 squared of delta two is here. And then if I look more, uh, that is, uh, basically, every time that I'm applying T on the red interval, it's shrinking towards zero. And I can look how many iterates it takes me until I can fully stay inside. So for how many iterates? So for, ah, we didn't do the main thing. I'm so sorry, I missed one bit. I missed one bit. Sorry, I need to go back. I haven't proven the full proposition because I didn't show you the ratio of the lengths, which was an important part. <coughs> so let's look at, sorry, I'm gonna go back to the first step. So lambda one was the length of delta one, and lambda zero is the length of delta zero. What is the ratio? So lambda zero over lambda one, what do I want to prove? Lambda one over lambda zero, I want lambda one over lambda zero. So lambda zero is alpha, is length alpha. What is the length of the reminder? The reminder is one, everything, minus A zero times alpha. You agree? I have to remove A zero times my big interval. But now simplify, what is this? One over alpha minus A zero. And A zero was the integer part. A zero was the integer part of one over alpha. So this is fractional part of one over alpha, which is the Gauss map. So this was part of the important part of the proof of the first step. And similarly, how many, so copies, the cardinality of copies 
of delta 1 in delta 0. How much are those? I need to take uh, the length of delta 0, uh, lambda 0, sorry, the length of delta 0, and remove, uh, sorry, the, the, this cardinal, uh, cardinality of copies of delta 1 in delta 0 is just, uh, I have to take lambda 0, divide by lambda 1, and take the integer part. Okay? So this is what uh, the definition I divide and take how many times it fits. Lambda 0, I hope I get it right. So I prove that lambda 1 over lambda 0 is Gauss of alpha. So this is integer part of 1 over Gauss of alpha. So this is the opposite ratio. And what is the integer part of 1 over Gauss of alpha? No. No. <laughs> No, so Gauss of alpha, uh, the continuous fraction was a 0, a 1, dot, 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 dot. A1. Yes, a 1. That's right. So, so what is the, so now I claim that uh, this point is actually, uh, this point is actually, what is this point? I think I'm going a little bit too, uh, uh, Let's see what I got. I think I can erase here. I want to keep the theorem. So I want to know if I do this A1 iterate, so if I apply my induced map on the red interval A1 times, what is the endpoint? So maybe let me draw it again. I have my, here I have R alpha to the Q1 of 0. The end, left endpoint, I want to look at the left endpoint of the red interval. So the red interval, I have to cut it, iterating t, one, cut the red interval as many times. Here there are a1 copies. And I want to know what is this point. I claim that this point is obtained by taking r alpha q1 of zero. Taking this point, first I have to map the interval here. To map it here, I just need to apply the rotation once, because this is the first time. So then I need to apply the rotation one, once. But then to go from here to here, I'm actually dragging along with the green. So the green takes a zero times to come back. So I need to, uh, apply R alpha to the A0. I hope I'm going to get it right. Um, uh, so, sorry, I have to apply it A0 minus one times because I'm already in the first copy and then I have to apply it A0 minus one times. So what is this point? This is R alpha to the Q1 plus Sorry, it's not a zero, but it's a one. So this number of copies is a one, plus a one uh, times one. Uh, you should think of it like this, as q one plus a one times one, where one is q zero. And so what is this iterate? Well, this iterate is q two by definition. So the moral of the story is that the end point, end point of reminder, is R alpha to the Q2 of zero. So what am I saying? Then now if I want to induce uh, on the next interval, so if I set delta two to be the reminder, set so delta two to be the reminder interval, so this delta two will be, uh, where am I? Delta two will be this small interval here. So if delta two is this reminder, this is my interval, uh, this one is my interval I2. And then I can continue kind of the procedure the same way. So let me just say, uh, set delta two to be the reminder. And then I have that I1 uh, is equal to I1, uh, sorry, uh, I2 will be equal to delta uh, delta uh, one union delta two. 
So maybe what I did, I'll show you the pictures. So this is actually how the iterator of the rotation on the whole interval looks right. Do you see the red interval? It goes along many times. And this is, the red interval, you should really think dynamically. So the red interval goes along, come back here, then goes around, come back there, and left leaves my little reminder. And now I want to pick the red and the green and induce on this arc. And I have one more step. Now if I induce the red and the green on this arc, I, <laughs> I get another, now I, uh, I get a smaller reminder and this is where I, I this is where I have to induce next. So I don't want to do the, uh, you can of course, this is the beginning of an induction. You could try to prove this whole statement by induction. But uh, I think I want to summarize what is the algorithm before stopping because otherwise I think we, now we are all confused on what's going on because we did too many steps. So let me streamline what's happening. Let me streamline the algorithm for inducing, which is now very simple. And it looks like this. I start with uh, what was right was long to the uh, it was long to the left and short to the right. So it starts with uh, this is alpha if you want. It starts with i minus one if you want, which is uh, uh, alpha, which is the whole circle, which is length one. So what my algorithm tells me? My algorithm you can think of it like this: take uh, this arc and chop it as many times as you can. This will be a zero times from the left. You are left with a little reminder. Call the reminder, so this was your delta zero. Call the reminder delta one. This is our first step. And now we get i zero. Uh, I, want, I might have messed up. Was this I0? Or I, I think I messed up a little bit. I knew I was going to mess up. Was I0 the one which I, did I define it with minus one or with zero? Huh? I think I might have messed up. I knew I was going to mess up. The, so I think it's, uh, I should have defined the, is it still here? No, the, the trivial one where I cut open the rotation, I should have called it I0. Did I call it I0 or I minus one? Okay. <laughs> because I changed the indices in the middle of preparing the class, which should mess it up. No, uh, and I think delta, will say it again, I erase this. And I1 has endpoint, I think I1 is a zero alpha, right? No, I forgot. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I think, okay, I think whatever was minus one should have been zero. Uh, yes, so I said that I1 had, uh, oh no, it was Qn and Qn minus 1, the uh, indices. So yes, so I think I1 was, uh, <coughs> or not, uh, I'm getting confused now. Okay, in the module of the indices, the next interval will be, I can check them up later, and I think on the notes they are right. Okay, so in any case, now I have, I, I start with large, large and a big interval. I chop the, in the here the, the small is on the right. I chop it from the left and point as many times as I can. I'm left with a reminder. And now I start chopping the reminder. Now I start chopping the reminder from the right as many times as I can. And I'm left with a reminder. And then I start chopping the reminder from the left. So basically for from n uh, odd, let's see if I can get it right or not, probably not because the indices from one end or they're odd or even, you chop, you chop the small interval uh, from the left end point as many times as you can and you're left with a reminder and for n even, you chop the small, for mem even, the small would be on the opposite side, uh, the chop the small from right, from the right end point as many times as possible. So each time you take the small, you go to the opposite end and chop it until you have a reminder. And then you look, small becomes large, reminder is the new small, and you start over, chop the small, and one time you chop from the right, one time you chop from the left. So this algorithm, which you can take as an algorithm, is actually producing the induced maps of the rotation on these smaller and smaller arcs. And that's what we try to convince ourselves looking at the dynamics. 
So this algorithm, if you want, it's, a, the, um, it's like a Euclid algorithm. It's a kind of geometric version of Euclid algorithm. And it, it is indeed a way to produce the continuous fraction expansion. If you have two numbers, you kind of chop one from the other. And, and it is also going to be next week, we will actually describe uh, an induction for interval exchange maps. And this is kind of the basic case for two interval exchanges. It looks like almost like this, apart from some convention. So I think uh, I will start uh, from here tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll rewrite again the algorithm. And then I want to show you also the Rocklin Tower pictures. Uh, and then I want to show you some applications. What can you do with this? So, okay. So, but hopefully.